But in chapter 1 and uh, verse 1 of, uh, of Daniel, we are told that Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem as if it was in his hands. But in verse 2, we're told that it's the Lord who gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand along with some of the vessels of the house of, of God. Let's just know that God is in control even over a nation that falls. Uh, the decision of a supervisor, chapter 1 and verse 8, we're told that Daniel sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. He makes a request to a supervisor, but yet in verse 9, it says that it was God who granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander and of the officials. In chapter 2 and verse 1, we're told that in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. But we find out in chapter 2 and verse 28 that there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place. Who was in charge of Nebuchadnezzar's dreams? It was God who was in charge of that. God, God is in charge of what you dreamt last night. Down to the very details of your life, God is in charge. The hand of God is evident in every chapter of the book of, of Daniel. It's really the great theme of the book of, of Daniel, the sovereignty of God even over the nations. There is a God who swallows up kings and emperors, cities and kingdoms, and this is the truth that Nebuchadnezzar finally came to understand in chapter 4. In uh, chapter 4 and verse 34, it says, At the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom endures from generation to generation. This, this is the sovereignty of God on display. We refer to a, a sovereign state, as a, a state that controls what goes on inside of its borders. But where are God's borders? God doesn't have borders. God is sovereignly in control over absolutely everything. Every square inch of this universe, God can cry mine. I like what uh, A.W. Pink had to say about the sovereignty of God. He says this, what do we mean by this expression, the sovereignty of God? We mean the supremacy of God, the kingship of God, the godhood of God. To say that God is sovereign is to declare that he is the most high doing according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth so that none can stay his hand or say to him, what doest thou? God is completely in control. Anything less than this is not the God of the Bible. As Psalm 115 and verse three says, our God is in the heavens and he does what? Whatever he pleases. God does whatever he pleases. Psalm 103 verse 19 says the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. The sovereignty of God or the unopposed rule of God is what we find in the, as the focus of the book of, of Daniel. And God is repeatedly called the God of heaven, the king of heaven. He displays his rule over all of the earth. Earth does not rule. Hell does not rule. It's heaven that rules. And God is the God of of heaven. His sovereignty is also displayed in the titles that are given to God throughout the book of, of Daniel. He's the, the highest or the most high. In chapter 2 and verse 47, the king answered Daniel and said, surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords. In chapter 4 and verse 17, the most high is ruler over the realm of mankind. Sovereignty of God is uh, displayed in his superiority over the kingdoms of men. Everywhere you turn in this book, uh, Dan Daniel, the, the, the nations of the earth are revealed to be nothing uh, but a drop in the bucket in the sovereign plan of God. He, he's the chess mover, moving all the pieces around on the board. We're, we're merely pawns in the hands of God. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar was made aware of in a vision that he had in chapter 2, where he said, let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes the times and the epics. He removes kings and establishes kings. What, what, what right do you have to boast about even being a king when you know that it's God who can topple you over at any moment he chooses to? God is absolutely in control. He can replace me with a pawn if he desires to. And every kingdom on this globe needs to recognize that it's only a temporary kingdom. And that includes Russia. And that includes America. <laughs> and that even includes Ukraine, right? We're, we're, we're all temporary and only God's kingdom is the kingdom that will not be destroyed. And that's the, the truth that was reinforced in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, where it says, In those days, 
of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. That's the kingdom that we're looking forward to. The, the kingdom that will endure forever and that will crush every kingdom that came before it. So what you find in Daniel is God making it clear that everybody else is temporary. Everybody has an expiration date and God is the only one that will rule forever. Also, what we find in the book of, of Daniel is uh, really the same truth that should be repeated in every generation because the book of Daniel not only speaks about its generation, but also the generations to come as well. It's uh, the book of Daniel is considered the apocalypse of the Old Testament or the, the revelation of the Old Testament, the book of revelation of the Old Testament, because Daniel looks into the future and says that this God is still going to reign. He's forever going to reign. And there's going to be other kings, other nations that will rise up and try to overthrow God. But none of these uh, rebellions will work. Daniel chapter seven, verse 13 says, I kept looking in the night visions. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. He came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory and a kingdom that all the people's nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. There's really no more perfect book to jump into to uh, remind us of the end times than the book of, of Daniel. Uh, there's so many parallels between what we find in Daniel and what will happen in the end of days. In uh, the book of Daniel, we find that rulers rose up who boasted great things of themselves. But that's the same thing that's going to happen in the future with the Antichrist, right? In Daniel chapter 7, it says this, For the ten horns out of his kingdom, ten kings will arise, another will arise after them. He will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings, and he will speak out against the Most High. There's coming a, a future ruler that will boast great things about himself. Just as it appeared that no one could be delivered from the hand of the Babylonian king, there will also be another one who will arise that it seems like nobody can deliver from his hand as well. And in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25, it says, He will wear down the saints of the highest one. He will intend to make alterations in times and law, and they will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But even that ruler will be brought down. And just as the kings of the past were crushed and made to recognize that it's heaven that rules, there will be a future king who will be crushed and made to realize that it's heaven that rules. In Daniel chapter 7 and verse 26, it says the court will sit for judgment. His dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. And the point that I, I really want to drive home is that God wins. God wins. It doesn't matter what the chess pieces on the board are doing. It is God who controls the pieces and God wins. There's a God who sits in the heavens and does whatever he pleases. And that's good to know because it would be pretty hard to convince anybody to uh, stand on the side of a God who's a loser. If, if God loses in the end, why are we, why are we serving him? It's just like uh, when uh, uh, Elijah stood on the top of Mount Carmel, and he says, hey, if, if Baal is God, follow him. If, if he's the one that's got more power, why don't you follow him? But if the Lord is God, follow him. We, we follow the Lord because it is the Lord who rules. It's the Lord who wins in the end. And as we know that uh, this one who comes to receive the kingdom from the ancient of days, it is Jesus Christ himself. It's Jesus who wins. The kingdoms of this world are not going to last. They'll be given over to the son of God and Jesus Christ will reign. Amen. Let's take a look again at uh, Daniel chapter one. I'll just read verses one down to verse eight. Daniel chapter one. So it's in the third year of the king of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths in whom was no defect who were good looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he had drank and appointed that they 
should be educated three years, at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Now among them, from the sons of Judah, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them. And to Daniel, he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. Why don't you bow with me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you, God, so much for uh, just another opportunity to hear your word. Now, Father, I pray that you would open up your word to us, help us to, to behold wonderful things in your law. Now, Father, I pray that uh, you would help us to uh, have a greater vision, a greater understanding, a greater appreciation for who you've revealed yourself to be in the scriptures. And uh, Father, I pray that you would use me as a weak instrument to be a blessing to your people, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This passage introduces us to a dark time in Israel's history. Uh, the golden age of Israel is long gone by this point. Uh, during the reigns of David and Solomon, Israel experienced expansion and prosperity. Uh, the Queen of Sheba even remarks that, you know, not even the half was told to her about all that uh, the, the wisdom and the riches of, of Israel. But that was 300 years ago by this point. Uh, Israel has significantly declined in power and influence in the the world powers of this time, uh, Egypt, uh, Babylon, Assyria, are, are really kind of bouncing, you know, Judah back and forth just like a, a rag doll. In the, the Battle of Carchemish in 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the, uh, really at this time the, uh, the general of Babylon, overthrew the Assyrian Empire, and uh, he follows his victory by marching through his newly conquered lands and demanding that they serve him. And he also marched through to uh, take the throne of his father who had passed to receive the throne himself. And in the, the first chapter of, of Daniel, it describes the first of three deportations to Babylon, the first being in 605 uh, BC. Nebuchadnezzar was so powerful that not even Egypt backed off. Uh, Egypt was, uh, was backed off during this time. Uh, nobody was able to oppose him. And uh, one of the smaller nations that Egypt controlled was Judah. Uh, but now in the time of their greatest need, not even Egypt would be found to protect Judah. God stripped away from Judah even the external form of security that they had in the other nations that were around them. They couldn't call on anybody else to come and save us. And in this passage, we're going to learn about five external securities that were sovereignly taken away from these people, these exiles, so that they would learn to trust in a sovereign God. Uh, Daniel and his friends first understood the difference between the external symbols of God's presence and the reality of it. Uh, but here we learn that God was stripping away everything else that they could have trusted in. Number one, we're introduced to the first thing that Judah lost, and it was national security. That's the first thing that they lost in uh, verse one. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Jerusalem, the capital of, of Judah, the southern kingdom, suffers defeat. And as you read this, you know, the, the first thing that should come to your mind is like, why in the world would this be happening? You know, this is Jerusalem. This, this is the city of God. This is the place where, where God has, has promised to, to have a relationship with. In uh, the book of Psalms 87 and verse 1 to 3, it says, His foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the other dwelling places of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. You know, I thought that, God was the defender of his people. Why would this be happening? Why would Judah be besieged, Jerusalem besieged and taken? Flip back to, to Deuteronomy chapter 2. Deuteronomy chapter 2 will let you know why this happened. Actually, uh, flip over to 28 first. Chapter 28, Deuteronomy chapter 28. I'll let you know why this happened. Why does it seem like God is forsaking his people? Deuteronomy 28, look at verse 1. It says, Now it shall be if you diligently obey the Lord, being careful to do all his commandments, which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. Drop down to verse 15, same chapter says in verse 15, but it shall come about if you do not obey the Lord your God to observe 
to do all his commandments and his statutes with which I charge you today that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city and cursed shall you be in the country. Drop down to verse 25. It says, the Lord shall cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You will go out one way against them, but you will flee seven ways before them and you will be an example of terror to all the kingdoms of the earth. Why why was this happening? Why was Judah being besieged? It's because the Lord was faithful to keep his covenant. The Lord is doing exactly what he said he would do because of their disobedience. Actually, later on in the book of Daniel in chapter 9, in uh, verse 4, uh, Daniel says, And I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant. God, you keep your covenant. And loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly, and rebelled. Why is all this happening? It's because of our disobedience. It's because of the disobedience of the people of God that they're suffering defeat. And because of their disobedience, they were stripped of their national security, defeated before their enemies. And I would ask you, what promise do you think our nation has of national security? (laughs) What promise do you think any of these nations have of national security? We often repeat that that line, you know, God bless America. I think the the question that we should ask is why? (laughs) why? Why should God bless America? when America does not bless God. Why should God bless America? When Jeremiah prophesied about the the judgment that was to come upon Judah, Jeremiah chapter two and verse 19, he says, your own wickedness will correct you and your apostasies will reprove you. Know therefore and see that it is evil and bitter for you to forsake the Lord your God and the dread of me is not in you, declares the Lord God of hosts. Even right here in, in Maryland, we're considering a, a bill, a bill is being considered that would allow a baby who survived abortion to die without any care and without any investigation and no legal penalties. Now, that was something that we were considering right here. And are you telling me that we're a nation that God should bless? Why, why should God bless America? And when we find ourselves not as secure as we once found ourselves, should anybody question why? It should cause us to turn to God. But that's not where Judah turned. They turn to the other nations in the book of Jeremiah. Again, it says that Judah was turning to the to Egypt. Chapter two, verse 18. It says, now, what are you doing on the road to Egypt to drink the waters of the Nile? Do you think Egypt's going to help you now? What are you doing on the road to Syria to drink the waters of the Euphrates? Are, are you thinking that these other nations are going to help you now? Later on in Jeremiah, he says, why do you go around so much changing your way? Also, you shall be put to shame by Egypt as you were put to shame by Assyria. From this place also you shall go out with your hands on your head, for the Lord has rejected those in whom you trust, and you shall not prosper with them. They also trusted in their false gods. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 28, it says, But where are your gods? Go, go to your gods now. Go to your, your idols now. See if they can help you. Those that you made for yourself, let them arise if they can save you in the time of your trouble. These things should have caused Judah to turn back to the Lord, to say, God, what have we done? God, you're being faithful to your covenant. I know that, Lord. We we cry out to you. What what are you leaning on when when the security starts being pulled out from underneath you? And and for some of you, it it might be finances, might be material possessions, might be physical health, it might be your job, might be education. You know, the falling stock market, you've placed your trust there and now all those things are being pulled away. Where do you turn then? Are are you turning to the Lord to say, God, I trust in you. You're the one that I hope in. You're the one that I I, I give my life to and I, I trust in you. My security lies in you. It's not in the things around me. My security lies in you alone. And what else will God have to remove before we finally do cry out to him? When are we finally going to realize that there's only one place that we can go? There's only one place that you can go for security. It's only to the Lord who rules over all. That's the only place that we can go and find security. It's in nothing else. And if if you're here today and you have not trusted in Jesus Christ, I want to remind you that whatever you're placing your security in will one day be stripped away from you. If you're placing trust in anything else besides Jesus Christ, There's going to come a time when your health will fail. 
There's going to come a time when your finances will fail. There's going to come a time when your friends will fail. Your family will fail. There's going to time, come a time when your life will fail you. And what are you going to trust in at that time? There's only one place that you can go, and it's to Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, it lets us know that there's one name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. And that name is Jesus Christ. You can't go anywhere else. There's only one place that you can go for eternal security, and it's not going to be in this life. It's in the name of Jesus Christ. It's by looking to Him to say, 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 Jesus I know that I can't stand before God on my own. If I were to stand before God based on my own righteousness, I would be cast away for eternity because I have no righteousness. All of my righteousness is like filthy rags in the sight of God. And who is going to be able to stand on the day of judgment when God gives the divine reckoning? We have to give a reckoning to God. One day we'll have to answer God. And if you are not standing in Jesus, you have no security. You have no hope. You're eternally lost if you do not turn to Jesus Christ. And in this case, these things were being pulled away from Judas so that they would turn to the Lord. When instead they're turning here, they're turning there, turning to their other nations, turning to their idols, instead of turning to the God that's above them. Would you turn to Jesus Christ today? Would would you look to Him to find the only place of rest, the only place of security that can be found in Jesus Christ and in Him alone? He's the one who lived the perfect life in your place who died as a substitute on the cross, bearing upon himself the wrath of God for all who would turn to him, trust and believe. And if you would today just acknowledge your sins before him, turn away from your sins, forsake your sins and run to Jesus Christ as the only one who could could bear the penalty that you deserve. And he rose again, proving that he had power and over death and defeated death and the grave. If you would but turn to him, the Bible lets us know that you could have life. You can have life today if you would turn to Jesus Christ. Number two, Judah was robbed of not only her national security, but her visible authority. Back to Daniel chapter one again. It says that the Lord gave Jehoiakim, verse two, king of Judah into his hands. The the nation of Judah was humiliated. King Nebuchadnezzar took their king. Judges chapter one actually gives us a picture of the kind of treatment kings receive when they were captured. And it lets us know about a, a king named Adonai Bezek, the ruler of the Canaanites who was captured by Judah. Judges chapter one, it says they found Adonai Bezek and Bezek and fought against him and they defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. But Adonai Bezek fled and they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. That, that's the kind of treatment kings received. They, they became like the trophy for the nation. And I will humiliate your king before you. According to 2 Kings 24 and verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar actually released Jehoiakim and says uh, in 2 Chronicles 36, he was 25 years old. He became king. He reigned 11 years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord his God. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against him, bound him with bronze chains to take him to Babylon. Uh, But like I said, in 2 Kings 24, it lets us know that he actually released him for a period of time. But still, he was humiliated. He he was bound. He was on his way to Babylon. And again, this would give the appearance that, you know, did God fall asleep at the wheel? I mean, here's our our, our visible authority. This would give the appearance that that maybe maybe God was was asleep at the wheel. Why would God abandon the the king of, of Judah? Doesn't Psalm 1850 says he gives great deliverance to his king? I mean, what's going on here? What happens when we are without our visible leaders, what happens? We know that ultimately God did not abandon Jerusalem and uh, there was a king who would come. We know that. But during this time, it, it looked like God may have forsaken his promises. What happens when our visible leadership is, is gone? For some of us, our visible leadership might mean parents, might mean political leaders, teachers, Pastor, my pastor is gone. My visible leadership is gone. What happens when when God tests your faith in that way? What happens when the Lord takes leaders home? What happens when leaders fail? We've seen that in recent days. It's a test of our commitment to to God, isn't it? When our visible leadership is removed, it's a test of our commitment to God as the one who truly leads us. 
One of uh, Judah's good and faithful kings was a man by the name of Uzziah. According to uh, 2 Chronicles 26, he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem, and then his reign ended in disaster. When he became so proud, his heart became strong, and he acted corruptly. In 2 Chronicles 26, 16, it says, He acted corruptly. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God, for he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Major blow. The, the visible leadership is gone. And in that very year, Isaiah 6 in verse 1 says, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw who? I saw the Lord. <laughs> I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of His robe filling the temple. Our, our trust has to be in the Lord who is always on His throne, the Lord who never fails. That's where our trust lies. Even when visible leadership is removed, my trust is found in our great God. Amen? And the next thing that was taken from Judah was, Religious ceremony down in a chapter one, verse two, again, it says that the king of Judah was given into his hand along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. And everything again seems wrong with this picture. The, the, the vessels of, of God were not common dishes. They were, they were used for the worship of the God of Israel. And to, to bring these vessels into the house of a of a foreign and a false God, again, gave the appearance that, that God was being a, a strong-armed, that somehow the, the gods of the, the Babylonians were, were stronger than the God of Israel. And the Babylonians had multiple gods, but their chief deity was a God by the name of Marduk, according to uh, Jeremiah 50 and verse 2. He was a, a God of the storm. And Babylon here, if you look at verse 2 again, it's called the land of Shinar. Why, why does it say Shinar? The land of, of Shinar. Actually, the, uh, the land of Shinar was the ancient uh, site of Babel. <laughs> Actually, that's where the, the word Babylon comes from. It comes from the, the word Babel. If you remember, uh, Babel was a place that was synonymous with opposition to God. It was the, uh, the home of wickedness in uh, Genesis chapter 11. You can read about it there. So they... It was known as a place that stood in opposition to God. And it's the imagery that would have been brought up as Daniel connects Babylon with Shinar, this ancient city, this ancient site. And he says that he's taken to the land of Shinar, the, the place of opposition to God. It's almost like, like Daniel's kind of rubbing their faces in it. D do you understand where these vessels have been taken? Like right into the heart of idolatry, right into the heart of opposition. The very temple has been defiled. The items that were used for the worship of God were taken away. And it seems like God has been defeated. But even the removal of these implements, these vessels, didn't say anything about the God who is over all the earth. If you remember in Daniel chapter 5, when Belshazzar, who was the, the king at that time, he wanted to kind of make merry and, you know, bring in the vessels of God and let's drink out of the, the cups that we've got from Judah. Let, let's do that. You know, kind of throw a party and we'll bring out these vessels of God. And it was at that time that a hand appeared out of nowhere to write his death sentence on the wall. What, what is God saying? You know, you might have the vessels, but don't think that you're over me. <laughs> don't think that you're in charge. I allowed you to take these vessels. Writes his, his death sentence. God is still the one who's in charge. But for a period of time, the ceremonial items were removed, and it seems like worship was being put to a halt. So how were the children of Israel to serve God without these external rituals? Vessels are gone, and in 586, the temple would be gone. Is that going to keep you from following the Lord? What if we had our churches taken away? You know, the places where we come together to, to gather to, to worship the Lord. What, what, if, what if our Bibles were taken away? You know, what, what if somebody came into your home to, to remove the, the Bibles that were in your home? And, and don't think that it can't happen. <laughs> don't think that it can't happen. I remember I was with uh, one of the brothers uh, from our church and uh, out at a conference. And he says, you know, what, what would it be like just to kind of, you know, sit alone in the dark for a while and just see if, you know, if all of our Bibles were, were gone, could we come up with like, you know, the, the Gospel of John, just remembering different verses and piece it together? And he, he says, you know, who, who knows if that time would ever come for us? We don't, we don't know that. Do, do you think that America is so strong that nothing like that would ever happen to us? You, you can't place your security there. But what if 
all the visible signs of worship were removed from us. Church is gone. Bible's gone. You know, the things that, that we use to remind us of the truth of, of God. What if all that was, was gone? Are you still going to continue in your confidence in the Lord of heaven? If you remember Daniel, even while he was in Babylon, Daniel chapter 6, it says that in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously. He, he longed to be in Jerusalem. He longed to be in the, the regular place of worship. But even though he was removed from that, Physically, it wasn't removed from his heart. And I pray that we would have that same kind of, of commitment. Even all, if all the external symbols were gone, that I still have the Lord within my heart, that God cannot be taken away from me. The fourth thing that was taken away was their physical geography. The men of Judah were taken from their homes. If you look at uh, verse 3, it says, Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, Youths in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, who had ability for serving in the king's court. This right here is the, uh, the Babylonian version of the college acceptance letter. <laughs> you know, uh, congratulations, you've been, uh, you, you've been accepted into the University of Babylon, you know, or taking the best and the brightest. And that's what, that's what they did. They, they walked through Judah they identified who are the best and brightest of, uh, of Judah and took them into their own university for three years of indoctrination. And the, the Babylonians were, were smart. They, they knew that if uh, they were going to survive and they're going to rule over these conquered peoples, uh, they actually wanted to rule over them with people from their own land. You know, I'll rule over you with you. I'll take you in, I'll indoctrinate you, and I'll send you back to rule over your own people. Like I said, this was the first of three Babylonian uh, deportations. And, uh, and here, before they destroyed Jerusalem, they attempted a, a softer strategy. I'll just take the best and the brightest, and I'll let them do the ruling. And they, they made this list of the who's who. Selected the best looking, most intelligent, most who had the, the most potential young men that they could find. And likely these were people who were in their teens, according to, uh, to Plato, in Persia, they began the education of youths at 14 years old. Xenophon, another Greek philosopher, said that the 17th year was when they completed their training. 14 to 17, that's high school. 14 to 17, they took these youths and gave them all that they could give them. So these young men, only in their teens, had this diplomatic training and uh, brainwashed, basically. No, or at least the attempt was made to brainwash him for three years. You know, how long do we give high school? Four. How long do we give colleges? Four. Babylon is saying, only give me three. Give me three years. And I can, I can indoctrinate them and give them our culture. There's a, a preacher, Donald Gray Barnhouse. He noted with interest that uh, the average age of 40,000 people who are listed in the who's who of America that the, the list at that time was under 28 years old. The average age, 28 years old. These, these are men who are disciplined in early life to make sacrifices. And uh, uh, what he said is don't underestimate what God can do with a young life. And uh, I'd say that today, you know, to the young people who are here, don't, don't underestimate what God can do with your life, that you can make a stand for the Lord even where you are, and uh, that the Lord can uh, cause you to stand up even in an evil day, even if you are taken from your home. And I'm not here arguing against high school or college, but I'm saying what kind of uh, job are we doing as parents to prepare our young people if they do go to high school and college? What kind of, what kind of uh, backbone are you giving them to stand up when uh, the teacher says that, you know, everything that the Bible says is a myth? Uh, we have no idea how many genders there are. We can't even define what a woman is. You know, what, what are you doing for your young people to make sure that they can stand during that kind of assault. What they wanted to do was reprogram them, re remove them from their homes, and uh, we, can, we can give them Babylon. One commentator imagines the experience. He says, undoubtedly, this was a sad and miserable time for these young Jewish captives. The journey from Jerusalem to Babylon would have amounted to roughly 680 miles. As they neared the end of their long and arduous journey, the glorious specter of the ancient city of Babylon began to appear on the horizon. 
Babylon was a larger city, more fortified, more ornate than anything the Hebrew youths had ever seen. Through the city ran the mighty Euphrates River, the lifeline of Mesopotamia. As they drew closer, there was a large bridge for them to cross before entering one of the many glorious gates of the city. Just imagine how intimidating the scene must have been for these Hebrew youths. Daniel had not chosen to be here. He was forced to leave behind his parents, his family, his beloved Jerusalem, the Hebrew culture with its focus on the worship of Yahweh. These things he would never see again for the rest of his life. He would be a resident of Babylon, probably only a young man of 15 years at the time. He now faced the daunting challenge of remaining faithful and true to the God of the Bible while living in the midst of an idolatrous and pagan civilization. And some of you might find yourself in the same place. In the, in the midst of a pagan and idolatrous generation. Maybe that's your school. Maybe that's your job. Maybe uh, you'll be deployed. Like one of the members of, of our church was uh, deployed for a period of time. And uh, where he was deployed to, all the other people that were around him and surrounded him uh, tried to uh, introduce him to sin while he was away. Alone, by himself, removed from his family, and now he's being introduced to all forms of sin. I've heard that thousands of Ukrainians are being forcibly re relocated to Russian territory. What, what if that were you, removed from everything that you know? everything that's familiar to you? Could, could you remain faithful to the God of the Bible? Or would you think to yourself, you know what, what happens in Babylon stays in Babylon. The Babylonians remove their national security, their visible authority, religious ceremony, and finally their physical geography. Actually, finally, not after that, their individual identities. Look at verse four, end of verse four. It says, and he ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king appointed for them a daily ration for the king's, from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank, and appointed that they should be educated three years, at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them. And to Daniel he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. The purpose of this education wasn't just to equip them in political science and business. Ultimately, they wanted to convert them into Babylonians. You know, I, I want you to be a Babylonian in your heart. In your heart. Oh, I want to be a Babylonian in my heart. That's, that's what they wanted. They were depositing all the aspects of Babylonian culture modes of thought, behavior, production, theories about how the world operates, strongly held notions about what's right and wrong, traditional beliefs, legends, customs, how you should adjust your behavior intellectually. They wanted them to think like Babylonians. Your language, your literature, it's going to be Babylonian. Nebuchadnezzar was a Chaldean. The Chaldeans were a, a community that rose to power uh, and kind of mixed with the culture of Babylon and the Chaldeans were known for being experts in magic, enchanting, sorcery. Emotionally, they wanted the affection of the Israelites to be to Babylon. And what's the quickest way to a, a man's heart? It's through his stomach. We'll give you the food that we have. Oh, look at the food. The wine from the king's table. You're getting the best of the best here. We're giving you these flattering gifts. And finally, they thought they could bend their wills. Volitionally, we want your, your wills to be to Babylon. We, we want your allegiance. And what better way to show that uh, we are worthy of your allegiance than by showing you that we've defeated your God. And that's what was really represented by these names that they gave them. You know, the, the name Daniel means God is judge. The name Belteshazzar, some understand to mean Bel is prince, one of the gods of the Babylonians. We're, 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 we're stronger than you. Don't you know that our God defeated your God? We're actually going to change your name to represent the God who's defeated you. Hananiah means God is gracious. Shadrach means I am fearful of God and one of the gods of the Babylonians. Mishael means who is like God. Meshach, uh, uh, some say means I am with little account. Azariah means God has helped. And Abednego means servant of the shining one. All these related to their the gods of the Babylonians. They're, they're trying to force them into their culture. And here you have Daniel who's not objecting to their 
reading their books. I'll read your books. <laughs> he didn't object to the to his name being changed. You know, I'll, 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 I'll answer to the new name that you gave me. But of all these changes, nothing that Nebuchadnezzar really desired was accomplished because he, he, he couldn't change their hearts. He could change all the external things. I can, I can remove you from your land. I can change your name. I can make you read my books. But he could not change their hearts. James Montgomery Boyce says he changed the men's name, but he could not change their hearts. They were true believers. And all the trappings of Babylon could not change that. The fact that these four men here were singled out should also tell you something else. That there were a lot of other men who might have entered Babylon that day. But guess what? They all bowed. Why, 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 why do Daniel and his three friends stand out in the midst of all the people that were taken in the deportation? Why, why do they stand out? Because there were so many who bowed, right? Remember when uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar had the, you know, all the, the music playing? Hey, when you hear the music, the flutes, the, the harps, when you hear all that going on, I want you to bow. And guess what most of the people did? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll bow. But Daniel and his friends would not bow. They would not yield. For some people entering into Babylon that day, they lost their national security. They lost their visible authority. They lost their religious ceremony. They lost their physical geography. They lost their identity with their names. And they also lost their gods that day. Lost their gods. It was enough to make them lose their minds and lose their gods. They lost God. But 1 John 2.19 says they went out from us, but they were not really what? They weren't really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. And my, my question for you is, uh, is there anybody here who's really not of us? And when things start to get hard and the world starts to you know, continue to be in chaos and turmoil, are there some that that's enough to shake their confidence in their God? What are you willing to give up your God for? Are you willing to trust in God alone, even when it becomes dangerous for you to trust in your God? When all the, the visible securities are taken out the way, when it's not no longer comfortable to associate yourself with God. There was a time when you could, you know, say that you were a Christian and it would help you on your resume. <laughs> that time is gone. <laughs> Saying I'm a Christian no longer helps me secure that job that I'm really looking for. It's a strike against me to associate myself with the God of the Bible. It is a strike against me. What are you going to do when it's no longer comfortable for you to associate with your God? Are you willing to give them up? Are you willing to cover them up for your own benefit? What are you willing to give up your God for? In his book, The Silver Chair, C.S. Lewis gives us a, a picture of the sovereignty of God, tells us the story of a girl named Jill who finds herself transported to the land of Narnia and finds herself dreadfully thirsty. She hears the sound of running water and moves toward it, only to find that beside the stream lay a lion. If you are thirsty, you may drink. Then the voice said again, if you are thirsty, come and drink. Are you not thirsty? Said the lion. I'm dying of thirst, said Joe. Then drink, said the lion. May I? Could I? Would you mind going away while I do? The lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. Will you promise not to do anything to me if I do come, said Jill? I make no promise, said the lion. Do you eat girls, she said. I've swallowed up girls and boys, men and women, kings and emperors, cities and kingdoms. It didn't say this as if it was boasting, nor as if it were sorry. Nor as if it were angry, it just said it. Listen to the rest of Jill's encounter. She said, I dare not come and drink. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, coming another step nearer. I suppose I must go and look for another stream. There is no other stream, said the lion. It was the worst thing she ever had to do, but she went forward to the stream, knelt down and began scooping up water in her hand. It was the coldest, most refreshing water she had ever tasted. Most of us are like, like Jill in the silver chair. 
we, we want God to promise, if I, if I come to you, you're not going to uh, allow me to be harmed, are you? If, if, if I come to you, you'll promise me my security, right? Like my family won't be disturbed. You know, all the, the trappings around me, like that'll still be there, right? And, and if, I mean, beyond anything, I mean, you promise me my life, don't you? You know, if I come to you, I'm, I'm going to survive, right? God makes no such promises. He makes no such promises. What do you say? If, if anyone comes after me, let him what? Deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. I make no promises that you will keep your life on this side of eternity. I make you no promises. But what he does promise is eternal life. What he does promise is if you come to me and drink, I will give you rivers of living water that you'll never thirst and you'll never hunger again. I promise you a life that this world cannot give and cannot take away. That's what I will give you if you come to me. But no, the Lord doesn't promise us position or power or possessions or safety or security in this life. He doesn't promise us that we won't be rejected, that we won't be hurt. And he doesn't promise us that we'll survive. But he does promise us eternal life for all who come to him, all who trust in him. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we uh, come before you, Lord. And uh, Father, we're grateful for your word. Uh, Father, we're grateful that you promise us eternal life, eternal security. Uh, uh, that's what belongs to those who come to Jesus. Father, as we uh, think about the, uh, the Hebrews that were taken into captivity, my uh, Father, uh, all the, the securities that they had were taken away. Uh, but Father, for those who truly trusted in you, the, the most important thing could never be taken away. Uh, they, they had a faith that, that stood firm even in the midst of turmoil. And Father, I pray that that would be the kind of faith that would belong to us as our gift, a, a faith that would last. Jesus said that, that he's the bread of life and he who comes to me will not hunger and who believes in me will never thirst. And Father, I pray for those who may be here today that haven't yet trusted in Jesus Christ, that they would come to the, to the living water, they would come to the, to the bread that will never run out, and that they would choose to trust in God even if God decides to slay them. Help us to trust in our Savior. In Jesus' name we praise you and give you thanks. Amen.